Welcome to CFRI Cystic Fibrosis Community Voices, a video podcast series created by and for the cystic fibrosis community. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Siri Vaith, Executive Director of CFRI, the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute, and I welcome you to this episode of our CF Community Voices podcast program. Today, we are going to explore an issue that is impacting over one out of four members of our CF community. Uh, That is food insecurity. And we are so fortunate to have with us today three people who are experts on this topic, uh, each of whom brings a unique perspective uh, and unique knowledge uh, to the discussion. Before we get started, as always, I need to remind people the information presented in this recording should not be used for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment and to please consult with your medical team before making any changes to your health care plan. I want to thank our sponsors who made this podcast possible, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Gilead Sciences, Genentech, Chiesa USA, and Beatrice. Thank you. And now it is my honor to introduce our panelists. Georgia Brown is an adult with cystic fibrosis and a Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, participant who lives in Ohio. Georgia is trained in public relations and journalism and shares her time with CFRI uh, through our advocacy committee and our CF Adult Advisory Committee. She also shares her time with the CF Reproductive and Sexual Health Collaborative, or CFRESH, and the CF Foundation's Food Insecurity Committee. I also want to welcome Tiffany Rufino, Cystic Fibrosis Social Worker at UC San Francisco CF Center in California. For for over 10 years, Tiffany has worked with children, teens, and adults living with acute and chronic disease, as well as their families, and she is a wealth of information on resources, including health insurance, medication assistance, and peer support. And I will also add that Tiffany was honored by CFRI in 2019 as our CF champion due to her incredible dedication to the CF community. And I'm also very happy to introduce our third panelist, Catherine Jacobs who serves as the Early Childhood Nutrition Programs and Food Systems Associate at the Food Research and Action Center, or FRAC, which is based in Washington, DC. Catherine works to strengthen nutrition programs, improve access, and improve food systems by analyzing program policy, providing training and technical assistance to anti-hunger advocates, and developing resource materials. We have quite the knowledgeable and dynamic panel here today. And so to get us, uh, I just want to say we will each presenter, each person, each panelist will present. Um, at the end, we will have time for Q&A from the audience. So um, I'm sure as each person speaks, you're going to have many questions. Please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box. And then when all three have presented, we'll circle back and answer those questions. Uh, so with that, welcome to all of you. And Georgia, take us away. Thank you, Siri. I appreciate this. Uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, for attending. Uh, This has long been a problem that I faced. I have uh, have been on the SNAP program uh, for a long time. Um, I faced food insecurity for about 30 years. Uh, Due to my health, I have very low income, and it's been quite a problem to Um, understand how these things work and how to best keep myself healthy when I'm on a very limited income and SNAP benefits are uh, very low for single persons. And I want to be here today and have this webinar to reduce the stigma and the embarrassment of talking about food insecurity. It is a part of uh, CF. We do have nutritional needs above and beyond those of our peers. And I think if we can have honest and open conversations and start this dialogue about how this happens, naturally and to a lot of people, I think we can shift how food insecurity impacts the CF community. I've been on the uh, food security committee now uh, for almost a year with the CF foundation. And we've done a lot of research uh, trying to understand the problem 
Uh, we have different arms that are trying to do advocacy and help with the CF centers. And you'll hear from Tiffany in just a few moments about some of the things that the centers can do to help people. But to do that, we need to really have the opportunity to have these difficult conversations. It's hard to go into your doctor and say, yes, I'm on SNAP. And yes, I've skipped meals, or maybe I'm not following the diet that you've prescribed for me. Um, I think as a patient, sometimes we think we're going to get in trouble. And that's not the case because we are really working hard at making sure that CF centers are aware of this issue and they're working diligently to have these conversations and to stigmatize it uh, and be helpful. And our goal is to have different programs at different centers that can help patients. There's also like FRAC in the community that helps. Um, to make sure that we have the information we need and the resources that are available to all of us, because I'd really like to see our small community have less impact by food insecurity. I'm willing to answer any personal questions. I'm um, here for that reason, because I really want people to feel comfortable enough to talk about this so that we can really reduce food insecurity in our community, I think that is really important for our mental health and our physical health. Um, you know, stressing over social economic factors like food is impacting our health one way or another. And I think it's important to reduce this barrier and reduce food insecurity. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm here to say I've been dealing with this for 30 years, and I want to do what I can to impact the community. So I'd like to turn this over to Tiffany, who, uh, as Siri said, is a social worker, and she can talk more about what the CF centers can offer when you have these difficult situations. Go ahead, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia, for sharing your story and helping to reduce the stigma you know, I'm definitely really honored to be here representing the perspective of the CF Care Center. I think the most important message I want to send, even if you don't hear anything from my slides or take anything away, is really that we're here to help, right? And we're here to have these difficult conversations and we want to support our patients and families. And, you know, I can say this not just speaking for my own center, but for centers nationwide. So, you know, please let us know if you're feeling any stress because we're definitely here to help. Um, let me share my slides. I put together just some different resources to share. So I want to talk about some things that, you know, that I've seen and that we've seen at the care centers, right? So, you know, we see families who, like Georgia said, might not be able to follow the diet plan or be able to order the supplements that we've recommended. You know, we see families who have to choose between, you know, paying the utility bill this month or paying their rent. And it's always a balancing act. Like there's this expression, robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? They're always trying to find a way to make it work. You know, we see parents who maybe cut, cut down on their own meals or skip meals so that their children have enough to eat. You know, and we see families who, for whatever reason or another, are just finding themselves in a situation where the food they bought for the month just didn't last and they're feeling stressed about buying more. I think the idea to take away is that food insecurity can happen to any of us at any time and it's probably happened to a lot more of us than you would ever imagine. You know, and we're here to help. So definitely talk to us at the center. There are resources that can help, which is really good. Sometimes we do have to be a little creative. You know, I've had families say, well, you know, we make too much money. We're never going to qualify for those programs. Or maybe they're already getting, you know, SNAP benefits or, and they're just not lasting that long, right? It's not really a huge benefit that people earn every month. So we have to be creative in thinking about ways to maximize the resources that are available to help families feel some relief. And so when I talk to families, you know, as a social worker and thinking about being creative, right? You know, what I do is not just look for resources for food, like particularly, but I'm actually looking at the entire, you know, household financial health and thinking about, you know, the different, I put this little pie chart up here because I broke it down into different categories, right? So there's income here as one category. 
And just really thinking about how can we maximize income? Is somebody you know, trying to work with a disability? Do they need accommodations at work to maximize their paycheck? Do they need to apply for disability benefits and actually you know, transition? Do they need help with that? Have they been denied in the past? Can we refer them to an attorney for some help? Some states, California is one of them, can offer some financial support for caregivers if they're on our Medicaid program. So can we set up a program like that? I'm also looking at insurance, right? Which is the other piece of the pie. So, you know, is there, are there a lot of out-of-pocket costs with the insurance program that a family has? Is there a way to maximize insurance and get some more coverage? And then I'm looking at financial resources down here, right? What can we bring in to help support the family financially? And this might be trying to add benefits like public benefits like SNAP or WIC, or we're looking at copay help. You know, maybe the family has a lot of out-of-pocket costs for medications and medical bills and, you know, and we're trying to find help in that area. Maybe there's nonprofit grants for the CF community or for the pandemic, or we can look at, is there a program to help with college scholarships or rent, utilities, activities? Does the family want to talk about fundraising? So just really trying to be creative. You know, again, it may be that the family is asking for help with food, but we're spending all of our time talking about disability benefits or, you know, something else over here so that then it's offsetting these costs and then they have more money to, to buy, you know, to pay for food. So in this talk, you know, what I'm really going to focus on are some specific financial resources, you know, and let everybody know where they can go to get extra help and a sort of a personalized individual plan for the financial help of their family. So I'm going to talk about some of the public benefits that are available. And Catherine will be speaking also about some of these as well from sort of a different perspective. So the public benefit programs, I'm going to talk about nutritional supported school, some national resources for finding food, resources for supplements, which we spend a lot of time working on at our center, um, resources for copay help, nonprofit assistance, help with utility costs, COVID-19 emergency funds, some great cookbooks and recipe ideas for tight budgets, and again, some resources for support. So you don't have to remember everything I talk about, but just to kind of give some ideas of, you know, different sources of assistance that might be out there that your care center or that Compass can help you with. Okay, so one of the big programs I'm going to talk about is the Women, Infants, and Children program, or WIC, which can provide supplemental nutrition support and breastfeeding support. It's a really big program. 6.2 million were served per month in 2020, includes half of U.S.-born infants. So women who are pregnant or up to six months after delivery and if they're breastfeeding, they can get support for a full year after delivery and children up to the age of five. So again, it can provide food, formula and breastfeeding supplies. Sometimes we've been able to work with WIC to recommend a particular formula. So usually there's one that WIC likes to recommend that's kind of on their formulary. And we might have some ability to negotiate a little bit with that and see if there's another particular formula that's really gonna meet the needs of our CF patient. So don't hesitate to talk to your CF care center about that if that might be something that would be helpful to you. You have to meet a nutrition, a nutrition risk category, which our CF patients will. So that's really not a concern for our patients and meet their financial eligibility criteria. So I have a chart here on this slide that just goes over roughly the household size and the income limits, but you can also be deemed categorically um, eligible without even looking at income if you're already getting a program like Medicaid or temporary assistance to needy families. And then this um, screening tool down here is just something you can go on to online to see if your family might be eligible, um, you know, or talk to your care center or compass to get a personalized referral. Okay, the next big program I want to talk about is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, and this used to be called Food Stamps. So again, huge program serving 41 million Americans right now, about 12% of the population, or one in nine people. Um, SNAP benefits had actually increased a little bit during the pandemic, and that increase was supposed to stop at the end of September. The good news is the Biden administration just passed a permanent increase in benefits. So from pre-pandemic until this increase on October 1st, it, it's about a 25% increase, so about $1.20 per day, about $36 a month per person. So again, not a huge amount when you're thinking of dollars but it's really good to see at least some shift in the right direction and moving the needle forward and increasing these benefits. So here's a fun fact, $1 in SNAP benefits generates $1.70 in economic activity. So if you're receiving SNAP benefits, you're actually helping the economy. And this is something that you can say to people who might say, oh, these programs are such a drain on our resources. Well, actually they're stimulating the economy and creating jobs. So it's a really good thing we have these programs. So I put up the household eligibility 
criteria in terms of the household size and then the income, but there are actually a lot of different caveats to eligibility when you're looking at, you know, household resources, who's working, who has a disability. So I'd recommend that you actually talk to someone to see if you might be eligible. Um, but I wanted to put that up there as just sort of a basic, you know, a basic framework so you might have some idea of the eligibility for the program. And this website here will help you find an agency in your state, or you can call the phone number I put on there. Okay, so another really important program we're thinking about nutrition is nutritional support at school, right? Kids are spending a lot of time at school, particularly if there is, you know, a preschool program where they go before school starts or an aftercare program. So schools can provide, you know, free or low cost meals, lunches and breakfasts. Um, I put a, gra a chart on there that shows you the household income for free lunches and for just a reduced price. The great thing is with the pandemic, um, states can apply for waivers where they can actually provide free meals to everybody under this program called Healthy Meals for All. And a lot of states have received those waivers, like California, where I work, the meals are free for, for all children, which really reduces the barrier and helps it to be very accessible for all students. Some schools will also have a school pantry program where families can pick up food at school or a backpack program where they can take food home with them over the weekend. Those are more local programs and you can see if that's something available at your own personal school. Um, another thing I like to talk to families about you know, with their 504 plan, they might be able to ask for a double portion of lunch at school. And I've talked to several schools who've been perfectly happy to accommodate that. Maybe your kid's a picky eater and they're not going to eat that, you know, second helping anyway. But, you know, if they would, and that's a source of meal support, you know, we're definitely happy at the care center to write that into our 504 plan accommodation support letter. So please don't hesitate to ask us if that'd be helpful for your child. So I want to talk about some national resources for finding food. The USDA Hunger Line is a phone number you can call from anywhere just to get resources in your area. You can also call your local food bank. You know, just a word about terminology. So sometimes you hear the words food bank and food pantry kind of used interchangeably, but they're actually different things. So a food bank is the agency in your county which is receiving all the food from different places, right? And they're figuring out where to disperse it to. And that might be the different food pantries. Like maybe there's a food pantry at this particular church on Sunday afternoons and you can go and pick up some food. And then there's one at the community center on Wednesdays, you know, from two to four. And so the food pantries are the places you actually go to pick up the food, but the food bank kind of, you know, they know all the resources in the community. So you could call your food bank and find out, you know, where are the food pantries? Does my program, you know, does my county have any school, you know, backpack programs or school pantry programs? Are there senior grocery programs, right? Maybe there's someone in your household who could qualify for that. Mobile food pantry, or even programs that can help with baby food formula and diapers. Um, another really good resource nationwide is 211 United Way. You know, all of these resources, you know, you can call and find out options for food in your area. Okay, as I mentioned, we talk a lot with families about supplements, <laughs> just finding ways to get coverage for those supplements because oftentimes insurance doesn't cover them. So one really good program to know about if you're not aware of it already is the Health Wealth Foundation. They have a vitamin and supplement grant where they can pay for $1,500 per year for vitamins, supplements, and probiotics. You can register by calling this number or by signing up online, or you can have your CF Care Center sign up for you and help you with that. Um, they do have income criteria. So I put a chart on there that shows the household size and the annual income. Now, here's a, a special tip to take away if you're interested in this program or are using it, is that the best way to work this program is to work with a pharmacy that can bill HealthWell directly can be a little more challenging to do this. They used to have to send paper bills. So, you know, what I would find from the CF Care Center perspective is that there might only be certain pharmacies who are able to do it. You know, some nationwide pharmacies, for example, are Kroger, Walgreens Specialty, or Foundation Care. The CF Foundation Compass Program may know of more, or your CF Care Center may know of more. But that's really nice, because then you're not having to pay for the supplement out of pocket and then submit for reimbursement, right? Because you may not have the money up front, or it could be, you know, money is tight that month, or you don't want to put it on your credit card and then wait for reimbursement. And meanwhile, you're accruing interest on your credit card for that supplement that could have been paid for directly. So, you know, that's definitely something to ask for help with. And sometimes it takes a little finesse to get it to work. But when it's working, it's a tremendous source of assistance for families. Okay, so another option for people to get supplements is if you have commercial insurance, like if you have, you know, Anthem or HealthNet or something, and you're prescribed an enzyme like Creon or Zen Pepper Pertzi, the manufacturer of that enzyme will have a program that's available to anybody regardless of their income, and you can order supplements and vitamins every month. So 
Creon, the CF Care Forward program, right? They offer the copay assistance. Every month you go in, you order your supplements. Although I think, you know, someone just told me they could order them for three months at a time, which was even easier. So that's, you know, one less step to have to take. Zen Pep does something similar and you can accumulate points that you can spend on reward items like different, you know, nebulizers and equipment. It's a really good program. Pertsy is a little different. You get copay assistance and then you get a $75 debit card every month that technically you can use to spend on whatever you want. It's not actually a lot of money when you think about the cost of vitamins and supplements, but it's nice to have the freedom. So if you're commercially insured and you have an enzyme, definitely these are programs to take advantage of no matter what your income is. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and kind of just talk about some other aspects of financial well-being and health, right? Kind of thinking about if we get help over here, then it'll help, you know, with food over here. So I always talk to families about resources for copay assistance and just making sure they're maximizing their resources because it all adds up, right? Copays, medical bills, health insurance premium. There are some programs that are more medication specific. So needy meds is one that I put up there at the very top. You can plug in the name of any, you know, any medication or supplements. Like you could put Insure in there and pull up a program for Abbott, um, or you could type in any medication and see if there is a financial assistance program connected with it. Um, Palmazyme has a copay card. No matter what your income is, you can qualify for this copay card and pay no more than $30. Vertex GPS has programs to help with CFTR modulators. So, you know, Syndico or Canby, Tricasta, Kaleidico, they don't necessarily have income criteria, but they'll take things on a case by case basis. So, I was working with a family and they had a $500 copay for Kaleidico every month, right? They actually had a really good salary. Dad worked for Google, but like this was a lot of money that they were paying every month for their medication. And, you know, once the, um, the genetic mutations were FDA approved, they were able to help this family. So another program, you know, those are sort of medication specific, right? Palmazyme and Vertex. And then these next three, HealthWell, Patient Advocate Foundation and the Assistance Fund, you know, can help with a broader range of medications. And sometimes it's a matter of maybe you're getting help with Vertex for your CFTR modulator and kind of saving your health well money for something else. So HealthWell, in addition to the vitamin and supplement fund, they offer $15,000 to help with medications and equipment, so nebulizers, things like that. Um, their financial eligibility criteria for this particular fund is actually a little higher. So you can be earning more than you did, you could for the vitamin and supplement fund. And it's a tremendous source of assistance, which is really nice. Patient Advocate Foundation also offers copay assistance. And what's really beautiful, they just started offering insurance premium support. Like I had a patient who was transitioning off of Medicaid a few months ago, and she was, you know, she was joining her brand new husband's health insurance plan. And they were faced with an $800 per month sticker shock for health insurance premium, which was something they were not anticipating. And they were approved for assistance from the Patient Advocate Foundation, right? So it's $800 a month they're getting help with for premiums, which is going to help with all of their other expenses. So a huge source of assistance. Um, the assistance fund is also really great. What's really nice is that their income eligibility criteria are a bit more generous than the other two. And so if you were excluded from eligibility for health well or patient advocate, you could try the assistance fund, even if your income is a little higher and see if they'll be able to help you. Okay, another category of assistance that I want to talk about is nonprofit assistance. I put just a couple nonprofits up here on this slide, like the Bonnell Foundation, Cystic Dreams Fund, Claire's Place, United Healthcare Children's Foundation, all great nonprofits that can help the CF community. Depending on where you live, you know, there could be particular programs available, depending on your household composition, whether you're a single parent, you know. I think that the best thing to do is reach out to your CF Center social worker and to Compass to just kind of get a sense like, what are some nonprofits that might be available to me? So United Healthcare Children's Foundation, you know, I'll mention, for example, you know, they'll help with people who have private insurance. They do have household income criteria, but they're a little more generous than some other programs. And they can help with, you know, co-pays, also medical bills. They can pay for private therapies. So maybe there's like this great therapist in the community you know, but insurance doesn't cover it and you want to go to this really great therapist, maybe they can help to pay for therapy for your child. Um, it is under the age of 16, so I should have qualified that. So it's good to see what nonprofits might be available. 
There is assistance available for household utility costs, so the Lifeline program can help with phone services. The Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program can help with costs related to home energy bills, you know, weatherization, energy-related minor home repairs. I was working with a family a few years ago, and they, they connected with this program. And now this isn't going to happen for everybody, but they actually got brand new energy-efficient appliances for their home to help save on their energy costs. I mean, it was wild. I had never seen anything like that. But it's worth you know, checking in with these programs because you never know what they can actually help with. And so it's definitely worth checking into. There's also the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, which is part of the pandemic. And you can check with your broadband provider to see if they have any discounts available. There are also different COVID-19 emergency funds. So um, some of these are really wonderful, like the Boomer Esiason Foundation. If you've been impacted financially by the pandemic, you can apply for an assistance grant. And I've worked with several families and they've paid for rent, which is a huge ticket item. And if you're getting assistance with rent for the month, I mean, you have so much more money available to help with your immediate needs for food and utilities and anything else that you need. National Organization for Rare Disorders also has a program. They can help with up to $1,000. People with CF do qualify. Um, I will say this program is a long waiting list. So, you know, apply, but kind of expect to be on the waiting list for four to five months before you get assistance, just kind of what I've seen from the ground, but still a wonderful program. And you can just call in an application. There's no, you know, big application you have to put together. You just call over the phones. So that's really nice. Um, there's also the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund for college students, where they can help with different expenses like food or housing, technology needs, and the college students would apply with their financial aid office. There's also the Pandemic EBT card, which um, is a pandemic program that's been available for families. You know, if they weren't, if their children weren't going to school and getting the school lunches, they could apply for the EBT card to actually get money on their card to pay for food. Um, Catherine from FRAC is going to be talking a little bit more about that program and what it looks like now. But, you know, even though in some way, in some places that program ended and others, it might still possibly be open. So, you know, check with your CF care center or with Compass to see if that could be an option for you. And they would be happy to do a little research for you. Okay. And then lastly, I wanted to put up here, you know, just some cookbooks and recipe ideas for tight budgets. There's this great balanced budget cookbook. There's a really nice cookbook called This Eating Stuff is Hard Work. And both of those, you can just Google search and download them for free from the internet and then print them out. They've got lots of really good recipe ideas for tight budgets. There's a nice website called CF Chef, which has recipes and meal tips for the CF community. My Plate is really good. They have lots of tip sheets, like five things to do with canned peaches, right? So, you know, just a little bit of creativity in, you know, how to um, make your money stretch and do creative things with the food that you, that you are able to buy. And then I wanted to close with, again, just resources for support. So definitely talk to your CF Care Center. You know, CF Care Centers nationwide, as Georgia mentioned, have been trying to be really creative and think about options for how to support families. Um, you may see us start to ask questions about, you know, access to food. And we're asking everybody because this is such a big issue and we want to help. You know, some CF centers have been, have been able to create food pantries. Others have been able to fundraise and get grocery cards for families in need. So there may be resources within your center that they're happy to help you with. I mean, that's why these resources are there. Also, CF Foundation Compass could do more of a personalized assessment as well and just see what resources they can pull together. And again, ask about different kinds of resources. Maybe you can get help with medication co-pays, and then that will help with money to pay for food. So I hope this was helpful, gave you a couple of ideas and things to think about and resources, places to go for support. You know, we're all here to help. And I'm going to turn it over to Catherine with, with FRAC. Thanks so much, Tiffany. I really appreciate that introduction. And I think if you stop the screen share, I'll be able to start my screen share. And But I just want to, again, thank all of you for attending this webinar. Really excited to be here. And I'm excited to take, uh, as Tiffany mentioned, a deeper dive into the extent of this issue of food insecurity. And then additionally, a deeper dive into some of those federal nutrition programs that are frontline supports for food insecurity during COVID-19 and beyond. And But first, a little bit about FRAC. FRAC is a national nonprofit working to eradicate hunger in the U.S. through research, policy advocacy, and we also provide training and support to other organizations working on hunger-related issues. 
And so for today's agenda, I'm going to talk about the extent of food insecurity and specifically during COVID-19 to really underscore that if you are experiencing food insecurity, you're not alone. It's a, it's a broad issue uh, across the country, in addition to some of those health impacts of food insecurity. And then I'll pivot to one of the key ways to alleviate food insecurity, which is those federal nutrition programs including how, including some resources for families to directly connect to the programs, but also resources for healthcare providers to identify foods and insecurity and then make referrals for your patients. And so starting off with food insecurity, what even is it? So food insecurity is the state of having enough of the kinds of nutritious food that you need for an active, healthy life. And so enough can mean different things for different people. Patients living with CF, uh, enough means a little bit more than, than other counterparts. And so food insecurity has two levels, actually, low food security and very low food security. And this will come in into importance a little later with how we're measuring food security during COVID-19. So the low food security level is characterized by reduced quality or variety of foods and worrying if food will run out. But when you have a reduced intake of food or when you are foregoing meals or not having enough to eat, that's when a person is said to be experiencing very low food security. And during COVID-19, the Census Bureau has been measuring food insufficiency, which is that, um, very similar to that very low food security category. And so before COVID-19, one in nine individuals experienced food insecurity or about 11% of people in the U.S. and 4.3% experienced that very low food security. And food insecurity varies by state as seen on this map. As the, the colors kind of move to a more saturated, that's where higher rates of food insecurity are seen. And during COVID-19, food insecurity dramatically increased. Northwestern University estimates that it increased from 11.1 to 16.2% for all people. And for individuals with children, that food insecurity rate is estimated to be 21% for every one in five individuals. And so these during COVID-19 estimates are for August of this year, and they were higher even earlier in the pandemic. And so in this chart, we're looking at food insufficiency, which you'll remember is that very similar to very low food security measure, meaning that folks sometimes or often don't have enough to eat. And so we can see that food insufficiency peaked in December around 13%, and the latest measures show that it's still around 7.8% nationally, which is almost double pre-pandemic levels of 4.3%. And so this chart also shows that food insufficiency varies significantly by race and ethnicity, with Black and Latino individuals disproportionately affected by food insufficiency as a result of systems of oppression, like systemic racism. And unfortunately, there's no current COVID-19 national measure of food insecurity among individuals with chronic conditions like CF. However, as Siri mentioned in the very beginning of this webinar, all prior data shows that individuals and households experiencing CF have much higher rates of food insecurity. And food insecurity is impacted by many factors, including the rising cost of food at the grocery store, loss of employment during COVID-19, food supply chain dis disruptions during COVID-19. Depending on where you live, you might have higher rates of food insecurity based on the, the food is just not available living in a food desert. And then also during COVID-19, children might have lost access to meals in school or childcare when, when those facilities closed. Additionally, we know that CF can also contribute to food insecurity by putting pressure on family budgets due to the increased need of food to meet the calorie requirements. And so now moving into some of the impacts of food insecurity. And this chart shows that hunger, poverty, health, COVID-19, they're all interconnected with each contributing to each other, creating the cycle that can be really difficult to break. And food insecurity is associated with a range of health consequences, both for adults and for children. Heart disease, depression, poor sleep, asthma, reduced educational performance, and on and on. And because of the financial, limited financial resources, households that experience food insecurity might use some of these coping mechanisms that Tiffany also talked about, like forgoing additional foods needed in CF, 
or postponing preventative needed medical care. Or what we see oftentimes is parents forgoing food so to ensure that children can eat. And these coping strategies can result in higher healthcare costs and uh, increased healthcare costs and healthcare utilization. But the good news is that there are tangible and actual solutions to alleviate food insecurity. And the federal nutrition programs like SNAP, WIC, and child nutrition programs are key health supports. And so I'm going to quickly run through a few of them, including SNAP, WIC, and the PEBT program. So as we heard before, SNAP is the largest federal nutrition program and a huge health support for qualifying families. It provides families with low income with monthly nutrition benefits. A family of four, for example, can receive up to $782 each month on an EBT card, which is similar to a debit card, and you can use those benefits to purchase food at most food stores. And right now it's easier than ever to apply because services can be provided remotely due to the COVID-19 social distancing requirements. And to find out if you're eligible to apply, you can visit your SNAP website at the link below. And I have information that all these slides with the links will be available uh, after, after this program. And so during COVID-19, it's an excellent time to apply because the SNAP benefits are increased by 15% through the end of this month. And that was enacted as a, a COVID-19 uh, bump in benefits. But those benefits are um, going to expire at the end of September, but on October 1st, due to the modernization of the Thrifty Food Plan, which is the food plan that the SNAP benefits are based off of, the SNAP benefits will increase by $36 per month for households that are, are members per member. And SWIC is a, another federal nutrition program that provides food, infant formula, breastfeeding counseling, to families with both moderate and low income. So the income requirements here are a little more lenient than for SNAP. And eligible participants, such as pregnant and postpartum individuals, infants and children age five or younger can receive those benefits. And there is a ton of research on the impacts of WIC. And the program is shown to improve dietary intake, improve birth and health outcomes, and many others. And I've included the links here to see if you're eligible and to apply. You can visit your state's website or call their toll-free number. And again, like SNAP, there's never been a better time to apply for WIC. Enrollment and appointments can be held over the phone or via telehealth. And many uh, clinics are still offering the opportunity now to go in. So it's really to meet your needs. If you want to do it remotely or if you want to do it in person, it's all up to you. And then additionally, a really exciting uh, factor is that the cash value fruit and vegetable benefit in WIC, those were temporarily increased this summer from about $10 a month to $35 per month per person. And it's anticipated that those will be continued for the next year and will be at FRAC advocating to make that permanent. And so now moving on to the child nutrition programs, which are another key support for all families with children. I wanted to focus on the new program that was talked about, Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer, or PEBT. And this program was created during COVID-19 as a response to kids losing out on the meals that they would usually receive in school or childcare when those places closed. And so PEBT provides nutrition resources to families who lost access to those free or reduced price meals due to their school or childcare closures and families will receive money on a new or existing PEBT card. And we talked about um, how it might seem like this program has been discontinued in places, and where that confusion comes from is that uh, PEBT is still running nationally, but each state has to apply. And so you can see on this map here, the green states are those that have approved plans for both the child care piece and the school age piece. And then the blue ones are just approved for the school age piece. And the additional change is that not all school age children or children under six will apply for PEBT anymore. It's determined based on your the, the school model in your area. So whether or not schools are fully remote or hybrid or fully in person, that will determine the amount of the PEBT benefit. And all states are anticipated to have plans, but they're, as you know, things can take a little time. 
on the Hill. And but to ensure when your state does have a plan to ensure you receive benefits, you should make sure that your school age child is enrolled in the free and reduced price school meals, which contacting your school district can help with that. And then for children six, uh, five years old and younger, you can make sure that they're enrolled in SNAP and that will put them in the system to qualify for these benefits. And now moving on to a few resources. To learn more about the relationships between hunger, health, and the federal nutrition programs, you can check out some of these resources, including the, the linkages sheet, which has that triangular diagram that I showed earlier, which is really comprehensive, uh, showing how each of these issues compounds and is cyclical. And then if you're an individual or a family interested in finding food resources, you can check out these resource guides from FRAC, CDC, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But to find food fast, you can use the Food Finder website or USDA's Summer Meal Site Finder for food for kids. And you might be thinking, well, it's September today and summer's almost over. But because of COVID-19, schools and community organizations are able to continue that summer nutrition program model through the uh, rest of the school year. And then we also have a host of resources for healthcare providers to help providers screen for food insecurity among your patients and then also refer patients to food resources, including the federal nutrition programs and also helpful food insecurity coding for the healthcare setting. Hunger Vital Signs is a two question screener tool that identifies individuals and families at risk for food insecurity the Hunger Vital Signs tool, it's really easy to use, only two questions. It's been validated both in pediatric patients and adult populations. It can be administered verbally or in writing, and it's also available in multiple languages. Addressing food insecurity in the clinical setting can reduce healthcare costs for patients, but it's also good for, for providers in that it improves administrative metrics like readmission rates and length of stay. And on this slide, I wanted to highlight the Addressing Food Insecurity Toolkit, which is a comprehensive toolkit developed by FRAC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it provides details on how to incorporate that hunger vital sign screener into your practice, as well as provides resources on how to connect patients to both community resources and those federal nutrition programs. And to summarize, Food insecurity is a really pervasive issue, especially during COVID-19 and especially in the CF community. But, and food insecurity has significant health impacts, but the federal nutrition programs are one actionable way to alleviate the issue. And there's many resources to help you and your patients connect to them. And so feel free to reach out at any time if you have any questions. And with that, I will actually pass it back to Siri for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Catherine and Tiffany and Georgia. And before we jump into the questions, of which we have many, um, I want to turn it back to Georgia to add some final thoughts. Thank you, Siri. I just want to talk about what it's like to be an individual. Uh, there was a lot of information about being a child and school programs, but what do you do when you're 50 years old and those are not an option and you're on disability? It's important to note that I get about $200 a month in food stamps, which is the most I've ever gotten. And that money with the price of food does not go very far. Um, most of the government feels that you can eat um, for the day on about $4 or less, which is really impossible to do for a healthy individual, much less someone in our situation. They also expect you to purchase, prepare your own food, which can be difficult when you're on IVs or you're not feeling well. Um, and going to the store was problematic when 
we had COVID-19, um, the fact that you can't buy hot meals or even a roasted chicken with your food stamps, which can cost $5 and be quite a few meals is quite a problem. Um, when you're sick, you don't really feel like cooking. And to make a healthy meal that's beyond a box of mac and cheese, it takes time and effort. And sometimes there's just days we don't feel like preparing our own food. And I would really hope one day we can change that because it's very hard to make sure you have the ingredients and make something healthy with fruits, vegetables, and protein. There's a lot of options like the prepared meals that can be sent to you. There's options such as the meals that they come pre uh, prepared and then you make it. And there's also just going into your grocery store and being able to buy something that's already hot that you don't have to cook. So the struggle for me has been trying to live on $200 worth of food and buy things that are not full of additives and preservatives. And that is really the struggle. And for us adults, that can be even more of a challenge because we don't have the safety nets like they do for children. So I just wanted to add that now that you have the information um, provided by both Tiffany and Catherine, your adult patients may have more difficulty with this problem. And that's where Tiffany's creativity comes in. So I'd like to turn it back to Siri. Thank you very much, Georgia. This, I mean, this, all the presentations were so complimentary and really all dovetail together. Um, so many incredible tips and resources. We do have a lot of questions. And the first thing I will assure everybody, as Catherine noted, um, we will release links that have the slides that Tiffany shared as well as Catherine's slides so that you can have all the links to the amazing, amazing tips. And I really appreciated the uh, focus on food insecurity, but then Tiffany, you're expanding it to a holistic way to the lobbying Peter to pay Paul, but the shifting of resources um, as a strategy. And Georgia, thank you for sharing your, your personal experiences. So I know I jotted down like 20 questions while you were talking, but out of respect for the people who are attending, <laughs> we'll go straight to the list. Um, the first question is, what do you feel is the best way for CF centers to screen for food insecurity, as well as other financial stressors and social determinants of health? And I know, uh, Catherine, you shared that tool, but Tiffany, and, and feel free panelists to unmute and just jump in and have a dynamic discussion. Yeah, you know, I'd be interested to see what Georgia might have to add sitting on the CF Foundation Food and Security Advisory Committee. But, you know, I think my perspective working at the CF Care Center, you know, ideally, I would want us to ask at every visit and just have it be a vital sign, just like when you're checking in with your medical assistant and they're taking your temperature or your blood pressure, you know because food insecurity can ebb and flow throughout the year. So they may ask you in January and everything is fine, but then maybe it's actually September when you're really struggling. And to be asked and asked again, I feel like it just, you know, in my view kind of reduces the stigma and just kind of makes it a normal part of healthcare. So that's my perspective. And that's, um, that's what I've told my care center to do. My provider is on the, uh, in the audience and I've asked them to do that at every appointment. Uh, we've incorporated into the intake and trying our best just to normalize it. We've come up with a handout that we can give to patients so that we can say, these are the resources that the hospital itself offers. And these are the immediate resources in the community. And then I've worked with our social worker on how to have those conversations and to just say, this is an issue faced by the CF community and it's okay to talk about. And that's why I've written blogs on it, hoping to encourage more patients and families to discuss it. But every visit is what I would recommend. Make it normal. Absolutely. I'll just second Tiffany and Georgia's points. That's 
one of, I think the first recommendation in the vital signs toolkit is to incorporate this screening into every, every patient every time uh, because hunger doesn't have a certain look. Uh, it's ubiquitous and we can't, we can't see food insecurity by looking. Absolutely. And that screening tool, I'm just curious, Tiffany, have you ever heard of the screening tool that Catherine shared the link to? Yeah, a lot of CF centers have started implementing it, actually, or might have shifted it a little bit for their particular care center. I know we have a pilot, we're starting to use it as well. So it's out there. And you'll probably start seeing it more because this is such an important topic within the CF community. So if you haven't seen it at your, at your care center, ask about it, you know, let them know that you think it'd be really important for families and you might start to see it soon. Well, the statistics are so uh, stunning, aren't they? The, the high numbers. And yet I think it's, it's with anything, we all have carry these embarrassments and shame. And if, if somebody's not asking the direct question, uh, we may not identify what the need is. So, so valuable to have that. And to the numbers, one out of nine people before COVID um, being having food insecurity, really, really stunning. Um, so we had a question, is there a specific profession like a financial advisor, social worker, or patient organization that can help sift through all the ways to maximize our finances to offer any, you know, any relief from this feeling of being overwhelmed? I have yet to find one, and it's taken me 30 years just to have this conversation. Um, I, and, you know, when you're very low income, it's hard because sometimes they want you to pay for that resource. And Compass, I know, does have some. Um, you might find the generosity of a financial advisor that is willing to donate their time. But trying to navigate it um, on your own is hard when you're ill. And I'm sure it's even more stressful for parents. So that's a very good question. Um, I, Tiffany might have more of an answer, but it's very hard to navigate everything. Yeah, I mean, I can say as the social worker at our CF Care Center, these are conversations I routinely have with families. And these resources are all resources that I've worked with and have helped people navigate. So it can't, because it can be really overwhelming. I know we just sent you like 20 resources in these slides and it's hard to know sometimes where to start. So that's why I would recommend talking with the social worker at your care center to see if they can help you kind of prioritize what might be most useful, where to begin. You know, it's always worth going to them and asking. Um, and I would I would check with Compass too. I know Georgia, you said sometimes they've only offered limited support, but I've seen really great things from what they've been able to offer to families. And I think it's definitely worth a phone call to them too. That's really, really important. And there's a comment, um, if people hadn't seen it in the chat, um, when you do screening, it is important to explain what food insecurity means. That reduces the stigma as well. And to incorporate that to say, you know, this is what food insecurity means and put it in layman's terms. And then also say that also means you know, trying to understand your financial obligations and how food works in with that as a whole unit, not just uh, fragmented. We know that the correlation between food insecurity and obesity, right? That you wouldn't think they correlate, but because of that reduced amount of uh, funding available and what foods are less expensive, et cetera, that quite often that happens. So um, it's related. It does, and I've experienced it. And, you know, when you're given $200 and you can buy 10 items for $10, you buy them. And then when they had packaging, I realized what I was eating was causing my weight issues. And then it caused problems with heart issues and sleep apnea and other um, comorbidities. And it's really hard to say that CF is sometimes easier than the comorbidities I faced. So being able to afford the healthy foods, I don't know that everything needs to be organic. Um, but I do try to read more of the labels now and I'm very selective with what I purchase and now I can even purchase less. And I would add on to that, that's one of the largest coping mechanisms that we see is buying, you know, relatively cheaper, high caloric density, but relatively low nutrient poor foods to 
to make food stretch and last. And so that contributes to the, the paradox of food insecurity and, and other health issues. So that is a really important point um, to combat folks that that are saying, you know, well, food security can't be happening because of these other situations. So very, very important point. And it's so interesting when you think of, you know, for my adult daughter has CF and, you know, her visits with the, the nutritionist um, and dietitian, the dietitian at the CF center, that that seems like there's another important role to be filling in that isn't just about checking the weight. It's what what are you eating and how are you getting there? And um, I know you had shared one of the resources. I think you had it, Catherine. No, I'm now I can't remember, but both links will be up for everybody soon about gro uh, grocery shopping tips to maximize low amount of dollars for the most nutrient rich foods. Um, so if people have off the cuff uh, advice, Georgia already shared some, um, is that tool, is that one of the links that will be available to people? Yeah, I had the balanced budget cookbook as one of the links. And then there was another cookbook too that you can download that might have some ideas. It's a CF specific cookbook that was designed also with just food insecurity in mind. What an awesome resource. And then another thing that I can think of is tap into your SNAP-Ed educators or your university extension service because they uh, snap ed educators are there specifically to help individuals uh, purchase a healthy diet on a, a lower budget. So they can be an excellent resource. And the snap ed is has it under a different name in each state, but I can also uh, put that link into the, the resources as follow up. And for people who are interested in taking this issue um, beyond the personal, uh, but to the more macro level and advocate um, for increased resources, I mean, $200 a month to buy your food for a month. And I know we, we celebrate the increase that has just been approved, um, but it's really not very much money. What it was $36 a day, a little over a dollar extra a day. We think when you, if we walk into a store with a dollar, <laughs> What does that mean to us, right? So um, where can people plug in to advocate uh, for more, for, to advocate for improved programs uh, to ensure food security? I'll say FRAC has an advocacy specific page and I'll drop the link into the chat as well, but there's always um, campaigns for action uh, to, to help advocate for things like that permanent increase in WIC benefits, additional increases in SNAP benefits. And I would say, Siri, that you hit it right on the head that we were really excited about the thrifty food plan modernization that led to this benefit increase, but we're not making a big deal about it because a dollar twenty a day, what can you get? It, it reminded me I watched I was watching a show and, and someone was going to give a, a dollar to a, a, a young girl to, you know, convince her to clean her room or something. And she sl slid it back across the table and said, tell me what you can buy with a dollar. And um, so that I think that really hits the point is that while it's in the right direction and I think we are moving in the right direction, there's so much more that needs to be right. done. And mm -hmm. there are many opportunities for advocacy by engaging with your Local Food Policy Council is one local way. And then at the national level, FRAC is an excellent resource. Feeding America is an excellent resource for advocacy. Checking out some of their websites, they'll have a, a action tab. And that's important because I think they've done more for children, but I think the disabled and the elderly uh, definitely need more attention, which is not to say that there's not a problem with children, but it would be nice if we could focus on the disabled and the elderly who often get lower amounts because we don't have the dependent. Well, we are coming up on the top of the hour, unbelievably. Um, but this is just, I mean, evidence. Tiffany, of course, why we honored you as a CF champion. You really set a high watermark um, in terms of social worker who cares and really takes a holistic look at each patient and family. Catherine, you are a wealth of knowledge. I hope that more of us now that we are, we are connected, we will keep um, promoting your advocacy efforts so that if people wish to become involved, 
Uh, Georgia, you have been such a strong advocate in many areas, but particularly around this issue of food insecurity. And really this webinar is thanks to you um, and you're pushing for this. And thank you for all your hard work um, with the foundation, with CFRI uh, to bring awareness. And this is, you know, this is not a one-off. This is an issue that is really impacting our entire community. And hopefully together we can work towards finding uh, better solutions. And really most importantly as the first baby step from this webinar, reducing the stigma and really encouraging people to, to seek the resources that will benefit themselves and or their families. Um, so with that, I do want to thank everybody who attended today. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be uh, captioned. Uh, so for uh, hard of hearing, it will be captioned. We'll also have it translated with uh, Spanish subtitles um, and we'll release it on our YouTube and Podbean channels. I thank everyone who attended and I am so grateful to each panelist, Georgia, Tiffany, Catherine. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. Mm -hmm.